So shall I introduce? For sure. Okay. So this is our speaker for tonight, Alison Perkowski. She has an MA in English Literature from the University of Alberta. And she is going to talk about the paradoxes of performing intellectual acts as an animal rights advocate, especially in the academy, how these paradoxes differ from the ones that other rights movements face and how literature addresses them. She is interested in hearing from other animal rights activists on this question. Do animal rights advocates have an obligation to use reasoned logical argumentation while doing outreach? So thank you very much for joining us tonight, and I'm looking at very for, uh, looking forward very much to hearing this. Thank you, Victoria. You're um, welcome. Yeah, it's really good to be here. I'm glad to see you guys. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to start. I want to express solidarity for the TAs that are on strike at U of T in York, and I want to thank the organizers of this talk for uh, deciding to move this talk off the U of T campus where it's usually held, because um, I think that both of those labor disputes are important for us to recognize. Uh, so I want to start by saying that. And yeah, my talk, um, I've sort of changed a little bit on what it's going to be about as I've continued doing research about it. So right now the title is Animal Rights and Intellectualism, Ideology, Ethics, and the Academy. Now, the basis for this is many major intellectuals, artists, scientists throughout Western history, Pythagoras, Seneca, Plutarch, Leonardo da Vinci, Mary and Percy Shelley, Franz Kafka, Benjamin Franklin, Nikola Tesla, those are just a few. They lived at least part of their lives as vegetarians for ethical reasons, and many actually wrote on the subject of animal rights, what we now call animal rights. Now, in an interview, Brian Greene, who's a prominent theoretical physicist who is currently alive, was asked about his own vegetarianism and why historical intellectuals have often been interested in vegetarianism. And he said, quote, from my limited experience, Vegetarians typically are people who are willing to challenge the usual accepted order of things. Moreover, they're often people who are willing to sacrifice their own pleasures in pursuit of what they think is right. These same qualities are often what's needed to make great breakthroughs in the arts and sciences." End quote. When he was asked why more scientists weren't vegetarian, he said, quote, I would ask more generally why the vast majority of people are not vegetarian. I think the answer is that most people don't question the practice of eating meat since they always have. Most of these people care about animals and the environment, some deeply, but for some reason, force of habit, cultural norms, resistance to change, there's a fundamental disconnect whereby these feelings don't translate into changes in behavior." End quote. Now for me, I've been wondering why so many intellectuals, especially academics who are in university, for instance, they've been trained in post-structuralism, they're sensitized to ideological oppression, but they're dismissive of animal rights. And as I researched for this presentation, I realized that this is actually a way bigger question, um, which is what is the relationship between animal rights and intellectualism as a whole? Or maybe more precisely, how directly is animal rights advocacy linked to what Western philosophy has always called human reason? Uh, particularly the, abil the ability for us to develop arguments based on evidence. Um, and that's something that other animals can't do. Non-human animals can't do that. Now, there's, this is a spoiler alert. There's no way I'm going to answer all these questions tonight. I just want to start talking about them. Um, and I think it'll be interesting for us to talk about, because I think that probably most of us have encountered scholars or professionals who fight against colonialism, racism, sexism, but who are unwilling to act on speciesism and don't recognize its hallmarks as very similar to those other violent isms. Now, in this talk, I, I pick a little bit on academia because it's our contemporary industry of intellectualism. Um, so, Louis Althusser, who's a Marxist theorist, he's behind door number one there on the board, if I spell his name, talks about how school has become the primary institution for te teaching ideology. For most of Western history, that position was held by the church, um, but since sort of the advent of postmodernism, he argues that it's become the school. Now, just a broad definition here. When I say ideology, I mean the dominant system of thought that forms culture, the basis of cultural identity, basically. So the systems of ideas that perpetuate our status quo. Ideologies operate mostly invisibly in the sense that we don't usually think about them or question them. The word ideology isn't inherently negative, but when they're dangerous, it's because 
their invisibility covers up tacit violence against those who don't fit into them, those who don't have a place or a voice in the status quo, or because they preserve a structural inequality. Now, why is school the primary institution for teaching ideology? Why does Althusser say that? Well, what do we learn at school? Skills like math and reading. But we also learn ideological things as well. We learn to follow rules. We learn to obey authority. And we learn where we're going to fit into a social class structure. Those skills that we learn, like math and reading, are meant to train us for future jobs. So if you think of academic streaming in high school, right? If you are a student who is expected to go to trade school, you get put in a different English class than a student who is expected to go to university. So the school system, including post-secondary school, is very much the, person, the place where ideology is taught for us. And if we can make changes to, ideolo to educational institutions, those changes are widespread because school is what teaches us how to, believe, how to behave and what to believe, right? Now, I think it's important, too, because I think that many of us in this room are already performing intellectual acts by defending animal rights, human or non-human. And some of us are within the academy and some of us aren't. So I also want to talk tonight about what makes someone an intellectual and how intellectualism is, re is related to the academy. Now, for the moment, though, I do want to pin down a working definition of what I mean by intellectual. So I'll ask you guys, shout out some names. When you think of the word intellectual, who do you think of? Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley? <laughs> Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault? Contemporary philosophers, uh, Zizek, Noam Chomsky, Judith Butler, and so on. <laughs> okay, yeah. Actually, I think that everyone that you've named there. Any other suggestions? <laughs> yeah. Peter Singer. <laughs> Peter Singer. Yeah, most of those were philosophers, philosophers, right? With the exception, I guess, of Aldous Huxley, though his writing is philosophical, his novel. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think, I wasn't sure whether you guys were going to say names that were more philosophical or names that were more um, technical experts in their field, because I think that both would be pretty, you know, classic examples of what intellectual is, the ways that intellectual is usually used. So some people that are primarily technical experts in their field, like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein, something like that, that's a commonly used definition of what it means to be an intellectual. But some people who are often called intellectuals, like Foucault or Zizek, for example, um, they're knowledgeable in their field, but they're also people who stand up for the oppressed. So Edward Said wrote a really convincing polemical book. It's this one right here. It's called Representations of the Intellectual. It's short. It's actually a series of lectures that was published in book form. He gave these lectures. But he's my inspiration when I say that I absolutely believe that the primary obligation of the intellectual is to speak on behalf of the oppressed, those who can't speak for themselves. So when I say the word intellectual in this talk, that is what I mean. Someone who's knowledgeable in his or her subject, and someone who speaks up on behalf of the oppressed. So that's a working definition. It's really incomplete. Obviously, 2,000 word years of Western philosophy have worked towards this definition, but it'll work for the purposes tonight. Now, last week, um, in her talk in this lecture series, Lorena Elk read a quote from Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Now, I want to thank her because that drove me to reread the essay where that quote appears. And I want to start there because that famous quote illustrates something that's really important when we're thinking about how intellectuals can do their work on speaking up on behalf of the victims of violent ideologies. But it's something really difficult. Now, as intellectuals, we don't want to use the violent tools that ideologies use, like oppression, division, manipulation. But at the same time, we have to, or we may have to, we might disagree on this, operate within the sphere of those ideologies in order to influence them. Now, that is an uncomfortable position for us to be in, and it may be that discomfort is a necessary feature of intellectualism. We'll come back to that. So I want to get things started by reading a passage from the novel Elizabeth Costella by J.M. Kotsea, who is an amazing, originally South African writer, but he lives in Australia now. Um, now, I'm a student of literature myself. That's what I went to school for. And a couple years ago, I, lect I lectured for this series about what I see as the contribution of contemporary novels to the canon of animal rights literature. 
and I looked at a few different books in detail and I brought that list with me if anyone wants to take a look at it or even better add to it because I'd love to know any novels that you have suggestions of that I could read that are not on that list at this time. And I talked about how literature can provide kind of like a practice ground for compassion for others. It's an alternate world where a reader can empathize with the plight of the oppressed and get comfortable with those feelings but there's no consequence, there's no risk of consequence in the real world. Now this book, Elizabeth Costella, it's a very aware novel. It's about a novelist. She's very well respected. She's in her 70s. And it's about her adult son as well. Her son's very protective of her. She thinks, he thinks that she may be losing her focus as she ages. And because the main character is a novelist, there's a lot of contemplation about fiction. Uh, there's a lot of talking about how literature acts as a foil for reason, which is this idea that's kind of obsessed Western history, human reason. And Elizabeth Costello, the novelist character, the main character, she's an advocate of animal rights. A lot of what she says and the criticism that she faces in academic circles will be really familiar to us that have advocated for animals. So in the passage that I want to read, she's giving a philosophical speech for a dinner held at a university. She is the guest of honor, and she's just made a comparison between human deaths at Treblinka and animal deaths in slaughterhouses. Now, as many of us know, the Nazi death camps in World War II were modeled after the Chicago stockyards. They're modeled after these assembly line killing factories that started showing up around the, the turn of the 20th century, and they've been in use ever since, not even increased use, more widely used today than they've ever been. And we know, too, that the comparison of human suffering and animal suffering isn't a popular comparison because one of the features of our dominant ideology in Western intellectual thought is that it's speciesist. Speciesism, I'll just give a really short definition of that, it values human characteristics over the characteristics possessed by other animals. That's obviously biased because we are human, we're going to value what we have over what other animals have. I don't think it's a problem inherently, but it's a problem if we don't recognize it. So we as intelligence value things like reason, complex thought, because those are what we're good at. But if you think about it, those are fairly arbitrary criteria. So for example, cats. If cats were to make, a criteria, for, uh, make criteria for intelligence, they would probably say that it depends on reflex speed and jumping ability. And by those standards, humans are pretty unintelligent. <laughs> and actually, researchers think that that might be why companion cats bring us prey birds and mice because they think that we're dumb <laughs> and that we're bad at hunting, right? Now, I don't think that the fact that we value our own type of intelligence is the problem in itself. The ethical leap that speciesism lets us make every single day is to convince us that because animals lack what we call intelligence to different degrees, we're justified in causing them suffering. Now, that is demonstrably, demonstrably false, um, even from like a logical standpoint. Whether an animal is intelligent or not has no bearing on whether we should be allowed to make it suffer. And as with other violent ideologies like racism and sexism, when you start to examine the logic that actually justifies that violence, it really starts to break down. The rigid binaries like black-white, man-woman, human-animal, they all break down when you start to look at them in violent ideologies. So for an example, human infants, they're less intelligent even by human criteria than adult chimps or pigs. But we would never say that it's okay to kill infants for food or to combine them to labs for invasive tests. Anyway, this is all an aside. It's all in this book. This is what I used for my kind of ethical grounding for this presentation, Peter Singer's Practical Ethics. Um, he actually very thoroughly, if you're like me and you really like thorough argumentation, it's a good book where he lays out a very thorough ethical groundwork for pretty much any situation. So in this novel, Elizabeth Costello, Costello is aware that her audience will be shocked even by an oblique comparison between Nazi death camps, human death camps, and animal slaughterhouses. She apologizes if they find the comparison crass. And then she says this. One moment, please. She says, I know how this kind of talk polarizes people. I want to find a way to speak of speaking to fellow human beings that will be cool rather than heated, philosophical rather than polemical, 
that will bring enlightenment rather than seeking to divide us into the righteous and the sinners, the saved and the damned, the sheep and the goats. Such a language is available to me, I know. It's the language of Aristotle and Porphyry, of Augustine and Aquinas, of Descartes and Bentham, of, in our day, Mary Migley and Tom Regan. It is a philosophical language in which we can discuss and debate what kind of souls animals have, whether they reason or, on the contrary, act as biological automatons, whether they have rights in respect to us, or whether they merely have we merely have duties in respect of them. I have that language available to me, and indeed, for a while, we'll be resorting to it. I could tell you, for instance, what I think of St. Thomas's argument that because man alone is made in the image of God and partakes in the being of God, how we treat animals is of no importance except insofar as being cruel to animals may accustom us to being cruel to men. I could ask what St. Thomas takes to be the being of God, to which he will reply that the being of God is reason. Likewise Plato, likewise Descartes in their different ways. The universe is built upon reason. God is a God of reason. The fact that through the application of reason we can come to understand the rules by which the universe works proves that reason and the universe are of the same being. And the fact that animals lacking reason cannot understand the universe but have simply to follow its rules blindly proves that unlike man, they are not part of it. They are part of it, but not part of its being. A man is godlike, animals thing like. And that, you see, is my dilemma this afternoon. Both reason and seven decades of life experience tell me that reason is neither the being of the universe nor the being of God. On the contrary, reason looks suspiciously to me like the being of human thought. Worse than that, like the being of one tendency in human thought. Reason is the being of a certain spectrum of human thinking. And if this is so, if that is what I believe, then why should I bow to reason this afternoon? and content myself with embroidering on the discourse of the old philosophers. Now, the reason that I read that passage is because I think it underlines this really striking problem that we have if we're intellectuals who want to advocate for animal rights, especially in an academic sphere. Yeah, Are you referring to St. Thomas the Apostle? St. Thomas um, Aquinas. Aquinas. Aquinas? Yeah, St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, he's the, what, the philosopher. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you for answering as well. Um, yeah, I think it under underlines this really striking problem that we have with we're intellectuals who want to advocate for animal rights, especially in an academic s sphere. The abilities that are prized in human intellectuals to read well and to write well and to make logical argumentation based on evidence those are a part of the dominant ideology of speciesism. We prize these abilities as humans because they're strictly human abilities. And often these same tools are used as weapons against human, non-human animals. Now, I just read a portion of Elizabeth Costello's speech there aloud. I, it tries to make an argument that's not completely based in reason. And J.M. Kotzea, the author, lets us see the audience's response to that speech. Um, through the character of Elizabeth's wife's, uh, son's wife, Norma. And Norma's a scientist. She conducts language tests on chimpanzees through the university. She calls Elizabeth jejune and sentimental. She says at one point during her speech, she's rambling, she's lost her thread. All of those criticisms are looking to disparage Elizabeth as being irrational uh, or emotional. So Norma sees irrationality as antithetical to reason and intellect and as having no place in a talk in a university. So on that basis, she's dismissing Elizabeth's talk as unintellectual. Now that's presumably the same justification that she uses to dismiss the chimps that she tests on, who she thinks are not rational enough to merit ethical consideration. Now literature, I think, provides an alternate world where history can be changed with little risk of consequence. So a novel about history, for instance, doesn't have to adhere to the same standards of evidence as historical documents do. Um, it can explore histories of the oppressed, who may have been left out by dominant ideologies, about whom there may be no documentation, for example. And we might not have any historical evidence of them. 
And novels can put forward irrational arguments or explore ideas by having characters put them forward, just as Elizabeth Costello does here. So as some of you have heard me say before, I think that literature can be a really useful tool in that kind of a theory, theoretical way. Now, all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome, Western philosophers have been interested in the question of whether animals deserve ethical consideration or not, but it's usually tied up with this idea of whether animals actually have reasons, whether they can think like us, right? So for example, uh, Richard Sarabji is an author who points out how a lot of the Socratic and Neoplatonic philosophers way back in ancient Greece claimed that animals had no ability to draw conclusions beyond what they saw and felt in the world. But then they would give examples that didn't quite settle with those conclusions that they made. So even back then, they couldn't decide whether animals had reason or not. So Aristotle wrote that animals are compelled to move and act on a combination of appetite and perception. So basically, they think, I must drink. And then they see something, and they think, that is drink. And they go and drink. For Aristotle, the appetite, the appetite and perception can happen without what he thinks is the ability to reason. But Richard Sarabji, this author who studies Aristotle, points out that that argument is kind of vague because if an animal is drawing the conclusion and drinking is simply a causal process, there's nothing actually stopping an animal from engaging in reasoning. So Aristotle doesn't seem to notice exactly how close he comes to letting animals reason. And the Stoics, uh, who came shortly after Aristotle, were similarly uncertain about whether animals could re reason either. They said no in all of their writing, but then they gave examples like this. So a philosopher called Chrysippus put forward an example based on his own observation of a hunting dog. They used to use animals um, for dogs for hunting for other animals. So the dog comes to a crossroad, crossroads while it's on the trail. So there are three possible paths, like a fork with three tines. The dog is looking for the prey, and it knows the scent of the prey, so it sniffs the first path, and it finds no scent. So it sniffs the second path finds no scent there either. So then what Chrysippus has observed the dog doing is that it'll take the third path without actually smelling it first. Now that seems to be deductive reasoning, but Chrysippus nonetheless says dogs only have sensory perceptions, they have no way to make any logical conclusions. But if the dog had no ability to make any logical conclusions, then it would have had to smell the third path to recognize whether the scent was there or not. Indeed, you could argue whether it would even be able to remember what the scent was for long enough to know that there was no scent, right? So it's kind of these interesting contradictions that show up even in the most ancient of philosophy about whether animals have reason at all. And the idea that animals are capable of having only a sense perception, of smelling or seeing or hearing something, and then reacting to it re reflexively like that has been very influential. It's the same sort of logic that drove Descartes' justification for his really horrific tests on animals, right? And that's the first half of the 1600s. So he famously said that animals were no more than automata. They were no better than machines, and where you press a button and something happens as a result, right? And that same has been very influential in the way that we think about animals in the present day. Now, more recently, philosophy has focused more on the idea that whether or not animals are capable of deductive reasoning, it doesn't cause us to, it doesn't justify us causing them pain. That view is summed up in this famous quote by Jeremy Bentham about animals. Quote, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So like Bentham does in that quote, we can use reason to discredit the idea that reason or intelligence should be the main factor in deciding whether a being merits ethical consideration. But like I talked about earlier, um, so I used that example of an experiment on a human infant earlier. That's an example of using, of deciding whether you should use reason to, as a, as a merit for ethical consideration. Um, if we recognize that example as faulty logic, we shouldn't be using the same logic to test on animals at all. That is, again, what Peter Singer does really convincingly in pra Practical Ethics. He, he draws out contradictions in the logic like that. But it's worth mentioning, too, the use of reason to discredit reason as a criterion for ethical consideration still does privilege reason. And reason is still a tool of species of them. It's still, to use Audre Lorde's metaphor from that quote earlier, using the master's tools, using what's valued by an ideology to speak against an ideology. So we run into a little bit of a paradox there. If we make reasoned, logical arguments against animal abuse, we're complicit for the moment, 
with the speciesist view that reasoned logical arguments made by humans are the best way to create change or to disseminate information. So the question I was asking myself is, is this okay? Now in short, I think so. Uh, we can probably talk about it a little bit. It's not an easy question to answer. It's not one that I can answer tonight. And like I say, I hope that we can discuss it a little bit further. Althusser wrote that in trying to change ideological state apparatuses like the university, quote, the resistance of the exploited classes is able to find means and occasions to express itself there by the utilization of their contradictions, end quote. So I think it's okay for an intellectual to take the position of partial complicity with ideology, which is a, contradict a contradictory position, because part of the reason there are contradictions in that position is because there are contradictions in ideology itself. It's something that other rights movements have faced as well. Um, so for example, the Audre Lorde quote about the master's tools is actually the title of an essay that she wrote when she wrote about how she spoke at a New York University conference about the role of difference in the lives of American women. And there was only one panel where black lesbian feminists like herself were represented. And she wrote, quote, what this says about the vision of the conference is sad in a country where racism, sexism, and homophobia are inseparable, end quote. Now, at different points in American history, of course, all women and all people of color were discouraged from attending university by policy or by law, uh, or they were forced to attend different universities than those who were attended by white men, that were attended by white men. And now that women and people of color attend the same universities as white men, there are still fights for equality of access um, against institutional racism and sexism as well. Now, the animal rights movement is a little bit different, of course. I wouldn't say that the aim of it is for dogs to be allowed to attend university or to vote or anything like that. But uh, it is, it, I do want to make the point that for historically other rights movements, it has been a battleground as well. Um, the academy is an ideological institution, right? To take a slightly Marxist bent again, it's what Althusser called an ideological state apparatus. So its purpose is to produce knowledge that reinforces the rule of the dominant class. People accept the institutional power of the university, but they, it's not the same way that they accept the institutional power of something like the military, for instance. You accept the institutional power of the military because you fear getting killed. You accept the institutional power of something like a university because you fear being outcast or mocked or ridiculed, like Elizabeth Costello was for um, saying the wrong things in her academic talk. So again, she gave a speech that did not conform to the academic standard of evidence-based arguments. And Norma, the scientist who tests on chimps at the university, someone with a lot of power in that ideological apparatus, mocks her and calls her sentimental. So in the essay, the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. Audre Lorde writes, quote, difference must not be merely tolerated, but seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. Only then does the necessity for interdependency become unthreatening. Only within that interdependency of different strengths, acknowledged and equal, can the power to seek new ways of being in the world generate, end quote. I just want to read that quote because I think it's wonderful. <laughs> So that essay that she wrote, it consciously operates in a way that actually complicates that title about the master's tools a little bit, because it's written in a consciously academic style. Lord is operating within the ideological institution of the academy to try and change it. So our ideology in Western intellectual thought is speciesist. It's racist as well. And the essay tells the conference organizers that they are racist, but it's interesting that it's using the language that racism uses. Even standard written English is inextricable from racist ideology. There are lots of dialectics of English, even in, say in America, there are tons of uh, different dialects. David Foster Wallace, who's a novelist and a logician, he's, he was an English professor, explains that some of those dialects have really highly developed internal grammars. Um, they, some of them make more sense than standard written English. Some of them have been around for almost as long. Um, but many of them are divided along racial lines. So it's a feature of a racist dom dominant ideology that standard written English is the accepted dialect for things like history textbooks, academic talks and papers, political speeches. Meanwhile, those who use other dialects, which are equally developed but are used primarily by people of color, 
are dismissed as uneducated. Now, Wallace writes that we might as well just call standard written English, quote, standard white English, because it was developed by white people. It is used by white people, especially educated, powerful white people. And he writes, in this country, standard written English is perceived as the dialect of education and, and intelligence and power and prestige, end quote. To his students of color who submit essays using grammar consistent with standard black English, he writes, quote, you can believe it's racist and unfair and decide right here and now to spend every week minute of your life arguing against it, and maybe you should. But if you ever want those arguments to be get listened to and taken seriously, you're going to have to communicate them in standard written English, end quote. Now, that's not an unproblematic passage because Wallace brings his own prejudice as an Anglo a white Anglo-Saxon male who's benefited from the privileging of standard written English over other dialects. But it's a good example for me to use to describe what I mean when I talk about the problem of having to work within ideology in order to change ideology. Now, black intellectuals have had to decide to what extent they engage with the language of oppression in order to fight against it. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, du Bois fam famously talks about double consciousness, which is the challenge as an African-American to reconcile an African history with an American ideological education. He writes, quote, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in an amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his twoness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder, end quote. And in other movements, in the struggle against the oppression of global colonization, um, past and current by Western imperial powers, uh, Gayatri Spivak, who's a leading post-colonial theorist, repurposes that idea of double consciousness to talk about self-altering self uh, self-consciousness as well. So that struggle of whether to use ideology's tools, um, the extent to which to work within it, the extent to which one is potentially or maybe necessarily complicit, that is a struggle that other movements face too. Speciesism is also a violent feature of ideology and we have to decide to what extent to use one of its features, reason, in order to fight against it. So that's what I mean by working within ideology to fight ideology, even though it's paradoxical, it's probably always extremely uncomfortable. Now this has all been very theoretical, so I want to use an actual example that I think will get us talking a little bit about it. So here's a specific example of what I mean of, by working within ideology to fight ideology in an animal rights context, and it's one that we can talk about. So I know that many of us in the room are vegans, definitely more than in our random sample of the population. Uh, one of the features of veganism is a boycott of animal products ob obtained from non-human animals, but it's a necessarily incomplete boycott, as we all know. right? Now, a complete boycott of animal products is theoretically possible if we live off the grid as squatters on self-grown produce. <laughs> if we so much as trade with a non-vegan community, the goods we produce are going towards a non-vegan economy, right? If we, as soon as we pay money, use money at all, or, or pay property taxes on legally owned land, uh, then we're complicit with a government that subsidizes animal agriculture, right? As soon as we put our money in a bank, we lose control over the industries in which it's invested. As soon as we live in a city, we have only limited control over whether the stores or farms from which we buy groceries also sell animal products. So we have to make a choice about whether to eat at restaurants which serve vegan food, but also serve animal products. Now, if we lived on, you know, the platonic ideal, the off-grid vegan squatters farm, <laughs> we'd be complete vegans. But the problem is that we wouldn't affect anyone else, right? The complete boycott is a complete renouncement of the violent ideology of speciesism, but it's not going to disrupt that ideology, it's dropping out. Now, I don't think a person who drops out, who lives on the vegan farm and completely cuts off participation in that violent ideology, actually satisfied, satisfies Edward Said's definition of an intellectual. Maybe he or she can write books or create art that denounce oppression, but in order for that work to be disseminated, it has to once again enter the ideology sphere of influence, right? One of the reasons is that, is that a complete refusal to participate means an unwillingness to face discomfort. Now, that's not to say there's anything wrong with that position of living on the vegan squatter's farm, um, or that it's not a comm commendable one. I just don't think it's a place from which we can perform intellectual acts. It's too far removed. 
Vegans disagree on the extent in which to participate in carnism. For those who aren't familiar with that word, carnism is an ideology under speciesism's umbrella. It's uh, coined by a word coined by a psychologist named Melanie Joy. And in short, it's the ideology that meat eating is kind of a default position and that there are no tenable choices except to eat meat. So I'll tell you my own participation in carnism. So I mostly subscribe to the dietary suggestions, uh, again, from Peter Singer, but in a different book, Animal Liberation. I don't go out of my way to avoid byproducts like glycerides, which are usually plant-derived, but sometimes animal-derived. If I order a meal in a pub, I will order it without cheese or mayo or whatever is accompanying that is specifically dairy or egg-based. But I don't necessarily ask the ingredients of everything that's within, like, say, a veggie burger. Um, because most of my friends eat meat, because everyone is influenced by his fear of seeming different, I try to present veganism as requiring few lifestyle changes. I see two benefits for me to these choices. One is that veganism is normalized for my friends, who as primarily meat eaters might not encounter it. Um, and the second is that on the surface, it has required few lifestyle changes for me in the sense that I haven't given up very many friends. Now, in their handbook, uh, Vegan for Life, I'm sure some of us are at this, Jack Norris and Virginia Messina, wrote that the minuscule reduction of animal <coughs> suffering that might come from avoiding byproducts like glycerides is not worth the danger of creating a perception that veganism is difficult. So that's kind of where I take my own philosophical background from. But I know it's a capitulation to carnism. So I bet even us in this room differ on our points of view on byproducts and on eating at non-vegan restaurants or, and on making a friend with harness. There are uncomfortable questions um, and whether we eat at non-vegan restaurants or not, if we are vegan and we are uncomfortable with the status quo and the fact that we take action on our discomfort does make others uncomfortable as well. We either lose our old friends or we face daily the evidence, um, the actual physical remains of, body on of bodies on which we are aware that violence has been enacted, right? So I think, and this is my own point of view, you're welcome to dispute, I will welcome discussion on this, that it is important to remember that the different choices that different vegans make are because of different views on how to disrupt carnism. And also to remember that we're all uncomfortable. And I think misunderstandings around these different views are what drive activists to infighting, but that's not the topic of, that, of this talk, so that's all I'll say about that now. Um, I do think it's important to remember that it is important that we are all uncomfortable. The carnist ideology is likely visible to us. It baffles and frustrates us that it's not invisible to most people. Now, for Edward Said, that discomfort is a key feature to intellectualism. He does not think an intellectual should be a safe and uncontroversial figure, though he also doesn't think she should be, quote, a full-time Cassandra who is not only righteously unpleasant but also unheard, end quote. On this matter of discomfort, Said has a quote from Theodore Adorno. The quote is, it is part of morality not to be at home in one's home. Now, I want to pause at this point and ask what you think. Like, what is your interaction in this room with veganism or other challenges to dominant ideology, feminism, anything else uh, for those of who aren't vegan? And does that idea of discomfort as a feature of intellectualism resonate with you? Definitely. <coughs> that really resonated with me, that idea of discomfort. Discomfort, excuse me, over what specifically? Discomfort in taking an action that you know is against the dominant ideology. So if you're a vegan, for instance, discomfort um, in being in situations where you are facing um, basically the remains of violence, where you are constantly facing the evidence of violence. Or if you're a non-vegan, um, maybe encountering people who are vegan who, uh, who want to try and make you encounter those remains. I have a problem with the animal liberation stance on nonviolence, because every time we see our pet cats hunt mice, every time we see a lion, tiger, and other carnivorous animal out in the wild tearing apart a be it a gnu or a you know a Nile crocodile tearing apart zebras, you know in effect that violence is massively in our face, and compared to let's say some of the slightly moderated means of doing away with animals, you know, to provide food for our species, which is, incidentally, and prehistorically, was a carnivorous species, is a little bit moderating, you know, we stun cattle before we, you know, kill them, we, out in the wild, 
it's nature red and tooth and claw. And I think that where one gets the discomfort possibly is the potential of mockery from the non-vegan, the non-animal rights community about, on the one hand, you know, you're proposing an extreme pacifistic, Quakeristic, you know, it sounds to me, or it would sound to people who, are, who would be in a position to mock, it sounds like old-fashioned Quakerism, old-fashioned quietism of a female right, because females and, and psychological tests have shown that females are extremely queasy, female humans, queasy about violence. We prehistorically were a gender that gathered, the males hunted, and it may be bred in the bone. And so on the one hand, in nature, there's a tremendous amount of carnivorism. We feed our pet cats and dogs animal byproducts. What are, what are we going to do, make them vegan? And yeah. on the other hand, we're... Who's we, by the way? Who are you speaking for? Well, well... You're speaking for no, the but the larger, But the larger Our community of, let's say, pet owners would be very surprised if they were told that, you know, we shouldn't be feeding meat. Well, the larger yeah. carnist culture is surprised about almost everything yeah. you say. But, 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 but there's point. a disjuncture there. There's a disjuncture there in that, in the animal world, there's a tremendous amount of violence and carnivorism. We are, I mean, where would we have cut off for humans and prehistoric humans? Let's say at Neander Neanderthals, at Australopithecines, where we would have not hunted, and, and that would have been morally okay or necessary. Okay, you know, where yeah, in our own I history would we have to have been non carnivorous? We're trying to take a carnivorous. Would like to answer. Yeah, yeah, can I address a couple of your points? That's where, the mockery, yeah, that's where I, I find the discomfort because I've seen that mockery. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely, coming. and that mockery is uh, is when I mentioned it earlier, like Elizabeth Costello faces, for instance. That mockery is a feature of standing up against violent ideology. I think. But do you mean violence as well, human on human violence? I just mean ide an ideology that values reason um, and values um, human dominance will will of course ridicule people who say something otherwise. No, um, this is this isn't about. It's about carnivorism. We're talking about veganism and carnivorism. There is a really, really big but don't uh, you think that problem in a, a problem in the argument in that the larger human community, the ones that are not vegan, not vegetarian, will say, "Well, wait a minute. You know, what about the animal world? They're tearing each other." <laughs> say, why? Why are you yeah. picking on us? Exactly. Like, <laughs> they're nothing but another species. Why aren't you picking on the tigers? Why aren't you picking on the polar bears? Okay, maybe there's a little bit of speciesism built in where we do think at least humans are susceptible to change in the way that the tiger is. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. That's one of the yeah. contradictions. At the same time, that's not going to diminish a whole lot of carnivorism. I mean, there's massive carnivorism but in the natural that's, world. That's very close to the naturalistic fallacy where you're saying that something should be permitted because it's natural it because we observe yeah. it in nature. Not and, just that, but prehistoric. But, but we, we know that. that but we know that. Uh, but what you seem to be saying is that is that uh, carnivorism is justified because it's observed in nature, but uh, we know that there are a lot of things that are observed in nature that aren't necessarily good. We can use our reason to but do But then that. we fall back on, then we need our reason. And so then, and yeah, so well, that's we have reason, and therefore we're the different. But I think that it's, a, it's an endless loop, right? Talking about because we, because on the one hand, like the dominance of reason, that's something that uh, we have been brought up to believe in in this in this uh, ideology, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's a tool that we must that well, in some cases we need to rely upon. Well, but then the argument in these becomes movements. contradictory. Where on the one hand you're arguing against the preference and dominance of reason, on the other hand you're relying on it. Yeah, I, this. that's one of the contradictions. But I think the problem is that the contradiction is in ideology itself. So we find ourselves in a in a position of contradiction when we're trying to argue against it. Now, yeah, I think you're right, Victoria, to identify there's a naturalistic fallacy there as well, as well as a genetic fallacy, because whether or not humans were prehistoric carnivores, and I don't think that's scientifically established, actually, I think it's debated. It is. Um, oh, but whether no, or not I mean, it is, it doesn't... Hunting weapons going back, you know, a million years. Yeah, well, it doesn't affect she whether or not omnivorous. it's what we should be doing now. So that is, I mean, it's a genetic fallacy to say, like the paleo diet, you know, to say that <laughs> what we should eat now is what we ate back then what we should eat now is what's best for us ethically and what's best for the world. I think. That might have been for survival reasons. They did. Yeah, we don't. We, really we don't know the the past necessarily, yes. and where we do know it, it doesn't it matter to what ethically farm. our behavior should be today. Absolutely. No, I know, and that's part of what's so interesting for me about this. And I don't intend to say that we shouldn't use reason. I'm sorry if that's how it came across. 
Uh, I just think You're that's just interesting. That's yeah, that it's uh, that it's interesting that there is that contradiction where we end up having to use one of the tools uh, that built the master's house in order to destroy it. Um, By the way, regarding the argument, you know, so you know, there is in philosophy a dominance of reason. I think that that argument is a bit of a straw duck because it ignores the last better than a century. Ever yeah, since I Kant, mean, yeah. ever since Kant, Freud, Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre. Derrida. Yeah, Over absolutely. Here. No, yeah, you know, absolutely. You That's know, why we focus on ancient history and sort of break down on reason. There's a massive takedown on reason. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's a class of classicist argument. That's like for old Platonist fogies or something. Yeah, but that's know, the interesting thing. Phobies. As far as animals are concerned, we're still kind of caught in that age. Except but that's for a populist argument. Very that's recent. Philosoph that's not a philosopher's argument. The philosophers know there's been a century of anti and reason and irrationalism that basically has won today. Postmodernism basically won today, and we're still living in a postmodern era. Yeah, absolutely. I would say so. And yeah. postmodernism is rational. Uh, the Paleolithic diet. They would have to eat raw meat, raw everything raw. They you have, have to, to eat do this uh, unless they want diarrhea or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, Jason. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, just getting back to your original question. I think. It resonates for me because I certainly feel discomfort in trying to meet my ideals of trying to be vegan and a vegan advocate, and then at the same time, say, mixing with people who are honest, uh, participating in parties and social events and, and, and the economy, and uh, and also this, this 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 difficulty with reason. Absolutely, I really. Um, I feel the discomfort, and I and I, I thank you for bringing it up because maybe it's actually good to feel discomfort, like Edward Said said, so that we're not comfortable, that we're constantly challenging ourselves and thinking about uh, where we're placed and what else we can do. So I think what I what I really like about this is that I can actually see the discomfort as something good, um, yeah, and something to continue continually reflect upon and improve. So yeah, yeah I think. That's Okay, yeah, so actually I want to continue talking a little bit about the obligation to reason. So hopefully this will address what you're talking about a little bit too. So I mentioned the name of a few um, intellectuals, broadly historical intellectuals, who are known to have been interested in animal rights um, kind of before the postmodern period. Um, to the point of taking action through their writing or through their diet. And there are many more who possibly lived as vegetarians, but whose diet is disputed. Isaac Newton and Plato are two examples. Animal rights activists have an interest in co-opting historical figures for the movement. We don't always thoroughly examine the evidence. And through social networking especially, it's easy for misinformation to spread quickly. So this uh, is an example that I came across last week, and I was talking a little bit to Paul York about it. So this quote attributed to Martin Luther King, it seems to be probably invented. It goes like this, quote, one day the absurdity of the almost hu universal human belief in the slavery of other animals will be palpable. We shall then have discovered our souls and become worthier of sharing this planet with them." End quote. Now, MLK's wife and his one of his sons are animal rights supporters and vegans. They saw kind of a, an extension of civil rights uh, as leading to animals. But during his lifetime, according to the King Digital Archives, and it doesn't seem that he, uh, they're all full, everything he said is fully available online for free through the King Center. It doesn't seem that he said anything about animal rights or environmental issues, even though online you often see him attributed as saying such things. Now, there's also the problem, of course, that uh, as with most of us, um, I'm sure most people aren't born vegetarian. Many may not recognize animal rights for the majority of their life, or for various reasons like societal pressure or food availability. They espouse a vegetarian diet, but do, don't follow it consistently. And history is recorded according to dominant ideologies. Um, species is like speciesism, uh, so it's sufficient to say that there were probably more intellectual vegetarians than we know about in history uh, in the West. Uh, for our purposes, there are plenty of known vegetarians who wrote phenomenal works making cases for animal rights. Um, and speciesist ideology is always looking for reasons to dismiss animal rights in order to, to justify the continued use of animals. So I'd argue that it's important for us as intellectuals interested in animal rights to avoid the possibility of information, misinformation um, and being dismissed for that. But I know that I'm, uh, some people disagree with me on that. So I'm going to give you an example of that bias of speciesism that I'm talking about in history. So Plutarch was a vegetarian for a period of his life, not his whole life. Um, and 
his works were translated in a translation that's still commonly used, for example, online by the University of Chicago and by Harvard. Um, they were translated in the 50s by a couple of editors. Uh, one of the editors refers to Plutarch's vegetarian as, quote, a foible of his early manhood, um, and end quote, because there is little trace of it in his later life is known to us, except for one corrupt passage that seems to say that because of a dream, Plutarch did stay from eggs. So from what we know, as I say, Plutarch didn't follow a vegetarian diet for his whole life, but I do want to point out the editor's bias there, um, which is consistent with speciesist ideology. Plutarch notes that his contemporaries in the first century CE laugh at a man who will not eat a sheep. That's a quote. Uh, in the 1950s, this editor of his work still refers to experimentation with vegetarianism for ethical re reasons as a foible. So that's certainly an example of that ideology that I'm talking about, I think. So this is another question I want to ask you. Do animal rights advocates have an, obliga an obligation to be vigilant against bias, even though speciesism shows it? Do we have that obligation to reason? So for this example, do we have an obligation to verify that quotes from historical figures are accurate? Well, I, I mean, uh, the quote that was uh, uh, to, to Mark, Martin Luther King, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, of course, I, I believe that the sentiment expressed there is still true regardless of whether he actually said it or not. I think it's definitely still valid. But at the same time, it, it goes back to what you're saying about how, uh, I mean, in order to be taken seriously, sometimes we have to use the master's tools. And I, I think that I think that uh, when, like, like for example, if I were to use a, a quote that that uh, the person it's attributed to actually never said, like that becomes like an easy target for people who will look at and who will just look for anything to uh, discredit the animal rights argument. Well, Plutarch is a notable figure, but. Uh, Pythagoras and Plato resonate even more. Pythagoras was a known vegetarian. Yeah. Plato was known to be a Pythagorean. And they say that Western philosophy is, quote, footnotes to Plato. So I go in that direction. I mean, why not fight dirty? Yeah, well, the thing is that there doesn't seem to be much evidence. I mean, Plato set up his republic as vegetarian, um, but it was for the reason of trying to use less land in order to, uh, to avoid war. But you can take the tack of, well, he was known to be a he Pythagorean. He was known to be a Pythagorean. But yeah, but no one actually made note. That's why he's disputed as a vegetarian. Again, it's not really written into known history that he well, was Well, there's so much right? that's disputed. I mean, a lot of it's fragments, whatever, but Pythagoras yeah. was a known, Pyth yeah, Pythagoras known vegetarian. Yeah, Pythagoras was a known vegetarian. Before vegetarianism was coined, people were known as Pythagoreans. Pythagoreans, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I take that tact. I mean, this is a battle. You know, why not fight dirty? Yeah. You know, they're fighting dirty. I'm not saying dirty, dirty, <laughs> but I mean, fight strong. Fight strong. Yeah. Fight in a masculinist way. <laughs> Not in a feminist, not a, not in a femaleist way. Any, yeah. Well, I think I think it's clear that there is definitely a bias. I mean, a lot of uh, vegetarians have not been acknowledged. I, I bought a beautiful book about Da Vinci, about everything about his life and his art and his science, and he was a vegetarian, and it didn't mention it in there once, not once, that he was a vegetarian. So um, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of uh, intellectuals have actually, where they have been vegetarian, his, history has been biased against it and seen it as an anomaly or something not important or strange. Um, but I do think it's important to be accurate, uh, one for credibility, and I mean, why not? Like if someone made that wonderful quote, it does stand by itself, why does it need to be attributed to Martin Luther King? I guess that's because we have some kind of preference for authority. If it comes from Martin Luther King, it's better than if it just comes from your neighbor. <laughs> but I, you, I guess, um, so it's great to have a notable figure support vegetarianism or veganism or animal rights, but, uh, you know, we should be honest about where, uh, where, who says what, I think, if we can, if that information is available. And, and frankly, it's incredibly uh, Eurocentric. I mean, all of Asia has a very strong sensibility of Buddhism, Hinduism and its after effects, Taoism. There was a huge tradition of vegetarianism and and uh, protection of species in the Eastern world. And you know we're living in what's now called the Chinese century. You know of, of economic and probable political and even military dominance. I mean, what the heck? You know we're we're kind of you know poking around in dusty old 
you know, Eurocentric, you know, Near Eastern centric, um, you know, artifacts when our own civilization is crashing around our ears economically. You know, it's it's ridiculously egocentric of us to ignore all of that. I mean, when you say the Western intellectual, there's been a huge movement on the part of Western intellectuals, including in philosophy, to the East. All of um, 20th century existentialism, a lot of postmodernism, is very, very much influenced by Eastern ideas. Heidegger was reading uh, Buddhist material. Sartre was, was reading Buddhist material. Heck, even going back to Kant, he was reading Chinese materials, Leibniz. Hegel was reading Hindu material. Uh, Nietzsche was very interested in Buddhism and, and praised it in, you know, in opposition to Christianity. And so why put this emphasis on you know, the European tradition when there is a very venerable, prestigious, and now of great interest to the, to the European intellectual Eastern tradition that very much valorizes vegetarianism? You know, why be influenced by one's own classicist, dusty old professors? Yeah, I think that the, the problem, to me anyway, is that politically, um, like, because Western ideology has been exported so wholly, and it's very colonial the way that it's being done, um, the problem is that, unfortunately, I think we are not influenced enough by the East to the extent where we're instead exporting our ideology in a way that's been damaged. Well, but that can be, no, but it can China, be demonstrated India, that we are influenced by the East. It could be demonstrated. You know, that the right, you know, running through the heart of Western philosophy over the last close to 200 years is a very great and even rising, continuously rising Eastern influence. So why not point that out? You know, we're sort of contradicting ourselves when we say, well, it's all still Western, and then, you know, running, scurrying back and timidly to the, to the Greeks, you know, for authority. Well, I think the reason that I focus on the Western tradition is because it's what I am familiar with. I know that there have been talks here before about um, vegetarian traditions in um, Eastern cultures. Um, but for me, like I say, I think the problem is that Western neoliberal ideology has been exported to such an extent that um, that meat eating, meat eating has risen and yeah. that an our animals toward uh, our attitudes toward animals have become more popular in other parts of the world that traditionally may have had different values. Um, yeah, by the time we're done, um, the East may be just a brief blip for aberration <laughs> to cattle culture <laughs> by the time so, the whole world's burning. Yeah. All right, I have probably about, I've been sort of mixing the discussion in, but how are you guys doing? I have probably about 10 more minutes of material here and then we can have a discussion or did you want to take a break now? What are you thinking? How does how does everyone as everyone okay, well, let's keep going? Uh, yeah, I, I think we should keep we should keep going uh, for the ten minutes, and then we can talk more can after. We can talk a little more after. Sure. Okay. So what I want to kind of say as a conclusion is that it doesn't seem to me that animal rights have been taken up by the academy as thoroughly as other forms of oppression have been um, in the past, say, fifty years. And again, you can just meet me on this if you wish. And. For one reason, I think that uh, one reason for that is I think that animal rights advocacy has had an uncomfortable relationship with reason and science, um, which are important features of the ideology that the university reproduces. Reason is the liberal arts cornerstone. Um, science is evidence-based, but it doesn't hesitate to draw its conclusions by testing on the bodies of non-human animals. So, for those reasons, animal rights advocates test the very foundations on which academic study is built. I think. That's not to say there isn't a place in the academy for animal rights studies, actually the very opposite. Um, we just have to be prepared to fight against dismissals like the one Elizabeth Costello faced, um, like that she is sentimental. We have to prepare for mockery. Um, and it's worth mentioning too that pursuing an ethical life isn't a priority for everyone, including many academics. It's not part of the neoliberal ideology that the contemporary university reproduces, I don't think. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, actually, as I follow the TA strikes. Uh, it seems to me, at least, that neoliberalism presents a life that pursues material gain or personal happiness as the default. Um, and we often revert to that because it feels safe or we forget to question it. But that's kind of a shame because, um, so again, Peter Singer, whose book Practical Ethics I've taken as the ethical foundation for this talk, talks about why we should live morally in the last chapter of that book. Um, it's his most speculative chapter, for sure. He points out that self-interest and morality, acting according to what's right, according to a code of ethics, rather than what's necessarily in your own interest, 
aren't necessary to antithetical things. Um, he mentions that the hedonism paradox. So when people achieve the material goals that they assume will make them happy, they still aren't happy. So the example, for instance, that um, studies show that lottery winners are almost never happy. Um, Peter Singer writes, if our life has, quote, if our life has no meaning other than our own happiness, we are likely to find that when we have obtained what we think we need to be happy, happiness still eludes us, end quote. Or think about a case, for instance, where a stockbroker has, is worth, say he's worth $50 million, and he commits fraud and risks imprisonment in order to make $50 million more. Why do that? He has enough to retire and live comfortably for a lifetime. But our dominant ideology is consumerist, where there's no such thing as too much material gain. Mm -hmm. Peter Singer writes that devoting ourselves to a cause beyond ourselves, at least anecdotally, seems to have personal benefits. Um, happiness might not be something that we can achieve by setting it as our goal. Instead, if we set our goal as living ethically, as an intellectual, for instance, um, devoted to the practice of speaking for the oppressed, it seems that happiness is often a byproduct. Studies and surveys seem to show that we live longer and are happier if we're altru altruistic. But again, this is his most speculative chapter, so this is probably the shakiest uh, ground that I'm treading here. If we question in what ways the ideology we receive from schools is racist, sexist, heterosexist, speciesist, consumerist, if we question where ideology is oppressive and speak up for the oppressed, then I think we are performing intellectual acts. We can do that from within the academy, we can do it outside of it, but I think it seems like we have to do it, at least for the time being, from within ideology. So that's what I want to finish up with. I think the duty of those who want to perform intellectual acts is to speak out on behalf of the oppressed. The duty of those who want to perform intellectual acts on behalf of the animals is to speak out on behalf of animals who are voiceless. And again, I'm going to end with a quote from Audre Lord here. Quote, next time ask, what's the worst that will happen? Then push yourself a little further than you dare. Once you start to speak, people will yell at you. They will interrupt you, put you down, and suggest it's personal. And the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and easier. And you will find you have fallen in love with your own vision, which you may have never realized you had. And you will lose some friends and lovers, and you will realize you don't miss them. And new ones will find you and cherish you. And you will still flirt and paint your nails, dress up and party, because as I think Emma Goldman said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. And at last you'll know with surpassing certainty that only one thing is more frightening than speaking your truth, and that is not speaking, end quote. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, yeah, now we can open up to a less formal discussion where I don't decide the questions ahead of time. <laughs> yeah? I don't know how someone could say they're carnivores, because uh, Carnivores would eat an animal, everything, the whole, everything of the animal, they eat even the they just stein into everything. I think there's a difference between carnivore and omnivore, certainly, and there are, I mean, in nature it's true that there are obligate carnivores, but we are not obligate carnivores, and we have the ability to decide whether we are They're not even omnivores. They're actually not even omnivores. Even omnivores, like bears, they eat everything. Bears, <laughs> Garbage. Yeah. yeah. They eat the, they just stein into the eat the few, the ones. Yeah, the raccoons. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So humans uh, can't eat all these things. Yeah, dogs are omnivores. Dogs are omnivores, yeah. Well, not chocolate. Not chocolate. No, yeah. <laughs> there are other things. Yeah. Well, I don't think to be an omnivore, you no, I mean, the whole everything. When I say, uh, <laughs> that would be Mausul, Dark Lord of the Under. <laughs> 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 the only, the only omnivore. <laughs> omnivore. I, mean, I was wondering. An all devouring maw. What the hell? No, when I'm eating that's everything, the whole animal they would eat. That's what I meant more. Like they, they wouldn't just leave like one part of the animal and just take certain parts. Oh, I think some carnivores do. Cats definitely do. Apparently, they even kill just for fun. I mean, even Native Americans and Canadians, you know, when they kill, they they did a ceremony for the spirit of the animal. They thanked it, and then they used, I think, pretty well all parts of the animal. You know, from everything from you know eating pretty well everything that was digestible to using the bones for you know, making tools and weapons, the hide for wearing, the, you know. Sure, yeah, I mean, for utility they, they, they were not wasteful. Sure. They were not wasteful. Yeah, even, yeah, certainly for utility purposes as well. And they yeah, didn't kill more than they needed. Yeah, well, I don't, on the planes they did, they used to drive. Well, they used to have the buffalo jumps, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, uh, 
but they weren't as wasteful as you know modern Western society by any means. We throw away so much. I was reading a figure that we throw away something like a trillion dollars worth. Of, I can't remember who, like the whole world or whether just the Western world or whatever. But like economically, like we throw away a massive amount. Of food. Yeah, I read a study that said the Western world throws away fifty percent of food. Yeah. yeah, but it's not it's just about waste. Yeah. Uh, is it digestible? Those meats, it's not digestible. Our bodies are not designed for it. Like they would eat rotten meat or carnivore. If the uh, road killed them, go and eat the rotten meat, they eat the puke. Yeah. <laughs> so where are we? Now you're the worst. Yeah. The worst would do that. My cat would do that. <laughs> Our cats, they wouldn't no, do that. No. They wouldn't eat poop. Dogs do that. <laughs> yeah, Tracy. Uh, thank you, Alison. That was really great. I, I guess I was wondering. So to be an intellectual, you need to be knowledgeable about your topic and you need to speak up for the oppressed. I, I would agree, but it's really interesting to consider, I guess, you know, other areas in the academia like the sciences or engineering, um, mm -hmm. how, which tends to be very limited uh, in scope, how, how, and I guess I put it out to everyone, how can they use that opportunity to uh, speak out about the press if they are not that's not necessarily the area of expertise. So what opportunities could there be? Um, yeah, we have a physicist. <laughs> there's there's uh, evidence-based scientists and then there's we can use reason. Yeah. How do you, you make the two? How do you yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a solid question. I mean, I have a liberal arts bias, so I'm <laughs> not the first to ask. I'm not the first to ask. <laughs> Actually, that ties back to I think you know, sort of like the sort of like a real indicator is the mockery that you said that uh, speaker uh, received from an animal, someone who experiments on animals, and the nature of science is that it has to be evidence based. That's what makes it science, and so. The scientific approach to living entities, uh, whether animals or even humans, and this has been a real war in the philosophy of science, is what might be loosely termed, you know, as a real example, is behaviorism. And behaviorism um, was an extremist, one might even say ideology of the science of, of biological beings, what can be observed and stated as you know, postulates as truths, you know, scientific, let's say, facts. And it, by necessity, had to disregard the internal subjective experience of the animal, including humans. So there was like behaviorist psychology, both as, a, as experimental psychology, where massive, massive findings were, were made. There was a lot of work done from there, you know, starting with, you know, figures like Paolo and, and, and um, you know, the American behaviorists. And they used and had to restrict to what they considered findings what was observable, which was behavior. And so you can't speculate about the internal subjective emotional yeah. state of whether it's an animal or, or a human animal. And so scientists, when they think anything to do with animal and human, let's say, experience, they are trained to think like behaviorists. And behave, for behaviorists, because you can't talk about subjective experience, they pretty well dismiss it and like, oh, animal suffering, animal emotions, no such thing because we can't observe it. Mm -hmm. And in principle, in principle. Yeah. And so that led to some real horrors, like, you know, vivisection and whatnot. It led to some real horrors in the human sphere because, for instance, the Soviet, Russian Soviet regime adopted behaviorism as part of their philosophy and and they use behaviorist practices, techniques like reward punishment on their population. They did not consider humans to be anything other than, it's a little, kind of a Cartesian argument that they're mechanical. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was the yeah. reduction of the human to the mechanical in Descartes' sense of the animal. Descartes divided the living sphere into humans which have holy divine reason and everything else, you know, animals which are machines and machines it's just an illusion that they suffer or whatever because it's just like the squeaking of a wheel, according to Descartes. Yeah. And so behaviorism came out of those roots, and the Russian Soviets adopted that for humans. Yeah. And so they treat them like machines that can be trained, and so the training got kind of harsh, like the gulags and the death and the extermination of millions. If they didn't want to 
you know, follow the reward punishment training of becoming collectivized, uh, you know, let's say collectivized farmers, you know, on the, on the collective farms, then the punishment was ramped up to the point where they died or starved to death. No big deal. It's just machines. And so that's the science side of it. And there's a real horror there. But then the contradiction is, well, then how, how do scientists come up with their theories? How do scientists, you know, you know, if there's no reasoning going on, what about your reasoning scientists, right? So there's yeah. an internal, you know, the, there's an internal policy there. Nonetheless, scientists, the training of scientists, you know, what they're going to hear from their elders is that you have to be fact-based, evidence-based, and the only tool is behaviorism. And so the person was mocking from a behaviorist position. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And so in the behaviorist position, what's written in is the animal doesn't suffer, we don't have the evidence for it. There's no such thing as subjective experience in our lights. N neither for humans. Yeah. So Stalin could torture to death, you know, millions of people on that premise. But the scientists, you know, in, in, in the Kutzi book would not would not make the same claim about tests on humans, right? So there's that there's still well, yeah, and there's a there's yeah, contradiction. Yeah. It's a logical yeah, contradiction, yeah. right? Yes, on yeah. the one hand, it's useful for them right. when they need it. But I, but I think that I think that's a very valid point that uh, the that's uh, the, the view of the the animal as the the automaton, like the the flattening of nature into a mindless entity that is opposed to the human being with holy fine reason. Uh, I mean, very, very famously, Adorno and Horkheimer talk all about that in dialectic of enlightenment. Like that has led, I think, I think we can be quite certain to the view of the human being as a unit of production, of, of production as a machine. Something I've also been oh, thinking yeah, about with regard to the strike. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. uh, I mean, like if you just look at our our own uh, neoliberal framework. Uh, it requires the reduction of the human being to uh, a unit of production with input and output and no particular subjective experience. It requires, like, the... It requires, as for Mark Luzo would put it, making the human being one-dimensional. And, I mean, considering that we are animals, like, what's the difference between, like, seeing the animal as an automaton and then seeing the human being? Yeah. <laughs> you said earlier something like academics, you know, they employ reason, they, you'd think there'd be a higher percentage that would come to the point of veganism because they would employ reason, they would see, they'd be kind of... That's, yeah, that's kind of where I started when I was wondering about this topic. Yeah, sorry, continue. So what are they, what are people missing? They, they've been taught from, from birth often that animals don't feel, they don't have, they don't, or their, their thought process is different. And you were bringing up many points. Like yeah. They don't deserve the rights. And then you were talking about speciesism and talking about how we, we kind of separate ourselves be, between I'm sorry, my thought process ended right there. But. Yeah, that's okay. No, I think that, and it's interesting actually because, and I know that we've talked about this in this series before, um, a lot of times, because I think that, um, I mean, a lot of what Altuser says is not um, necessarily all that useful um, as a Marxist theorist, but a lot of what he says about ideological state apparatuses does seem to really apply to our current moment, I think. Um, and so he talks about, when he says that school is the primary ideological state apparatus for us right now, I think I find that really compelling because I think that a lot of times before they go to school, um, children in most households will eat meat, uh, but because they don't necessarily make the connection that it's to an animal, that's something that comes a bit later. Um, but for children, animals are friends often. Mm -hmm. They don't make that, they don't have the same disconnect between it's different from me that we have when we're older, right? Um, so I think that part of that ideology must be taught at school. But another ideological state apparatus, according to Altuzer, is the family as well. Um, in church, you know, um, all of those things can pass down ideology. Um, so I think that is actually a evidence that it is ideological, the fact that when children are young, they don't seem to have those divisions. Uh, who was it, the famous quote, if you give a baby a rabbit and an apple, it's going to eat the apple and play with the rabbit? Rose. 
Is that? What was that? Uh, oh, is it Gary Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I've heard that reference many times, but I, I don't, I, I can't remember if there is a particular person it's attributed to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, that's very true. There's a professor at York University who does study human-animal relationships. And for her PhD, she looked at the attitude of children uh, to animals. And there's a certain age, she said, like, less than five. That's probably when you find that they have the most moral and ethical feeling for animals. Mm -hmm. And after that, it drastically starts to decrease. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, but in terms of not wanting to hurt animals, viewing them as friends, not wanting to kill them, uh, finding them wonderful, it's really positive when they're less than five, but by 10 or 12, it's kind of radically diminished, those, those characteristics. So um, I think the indoctrination starts really young, and it probably does start in the family as well as everything, yeah. you know, TV, school, um, all the status uh, apparatus. So I guess, uh, I guess all the intellectuals, academics, and universities, they've now, by the time they've reached university, they have been taught in certain reasoning, a critical thought, but they're still, that whole, the whole system is so specious that they, they cannot actually, very few of them end up being able to criticize it. And of course, those that go into biological sciences actually learn how to even further uh, cut off the emotions from animals by cutting up animals and you know, zoology class and learning how to experiment on animals. So any feeling they might have had gets erased even further because that's anti-scientific, unfortunately. However, I did want to say earlier, there are scientists who are making progress in terms of recognizing animal subjectivity and changing that view that we cannot study their inner mind. Um, by looking at the way they communicate, not just through human language, but through the Viewing the entire body as a communication system, you can tell a lot about animals, as we know. As every four-year-old knows. Well, as we know, as four-year-olds know. Yeah. So. Well, and, and there again, that's you know, you know, people who let's say have not had much exposure to academic philosophy sort of think it's a kind of monolithic, kind of one sort of structure. But there are you know opposing camps. There are debates that are you know pretty well you know sort of insurmountable. And again, this idea of whether subjectivity can be studied, whether it can be talked about. The behaviorists would say no, in principle. You can't see it, it's not public evidence, forget it. Which basically writes out all of psychology and psychoanalysis, right? Why go to a, a, a psychoanalyst? You know, he doesn't really know whether what you're thinking and reporting is the truth, etc. So, you know, that's a problem there. But, um, that position has been fought by the existentialists. And I think that, you know, to kind of capitulate to the scientists and say, oops, we don't know what to do now. I mean, just turn to the, to the huge extensive writings, you know, better than 100 years worth of existentialist writing. You know, the argument, the, argument, the counter arguments are there. Why not use them? You know, you can use them on behalf of humans because the behaviorists would even write out human subjective experience, right? You can also use it for animal. I mean, you go back to David Hume. David Hume. We have about you know, 30 minutes what is the emphasis just, on? We have about 30 on minutes left, and I just want to make sure there's time for, for everyone to say so. Alison, would you like to answer that question? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I guess to. Yeah, I think that, I mean, obviously, yes, uh, current philosophy is addressing, and ethics, for instance, the field of ethics is very much addressing. Um, the problems of behaviorism, which I don't think is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it's that much in vogue anymore, right? No. It's not, yeah, it's not like it's still it is, really widely believed. It is in science. But it is in science. In science still it's, yeah. yeah, so so that's why I wanted to use Peter Singer, for instance, because as an ethicist, he is very, he uses um, scientific procedure in the sense that he uses logical arg argumentation. Um, and. I think, I, I mean, to me it's problematic because, and there are other scientists, scientists of animal behavior, for instance, like um, Mark Beckoff comes to mind, uh, who's, who study, it just doesn't make any sense to me that you would look at something that is responding or look at other human beings. It seems so solipsistic to look at other human beings or at animals and just assume they must not be like me, they must not have an internal mind, um, that that would seem to be more objective than 
saying that um, I'll give them the benefit of, doubt, of the doubt and assume that they do. Yeah, I guess that's where we're in trouble. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to say this right, but um, so you're studying intellectuals, and you would think that more of them would use reason to come to the conclusion to, you know, like you were saying. That's what I tried um, to say. But I mean, does it make you more frustrated? Do you think that the rest of us, like, is that bad news for the rest of us? Like, they have all these answers and all this education and all these, like, you know, that's what they do, and they can't come to that conclusion. So what does that mean for the rest of us? Are you hopeful? Are you... I think that... Should everyone become an intellectual? Or that's... that's the actually, it's interesting. When I was writing this presentation, that's why I use the phrase intellectual acts quite often, because I think that'll... A lot of people, many academics, practice intellectual acts because they're interested in the plight of the oppressed. And I don't think that because they have not come around on the issue of animals that we should denounce them in any way. I mean, I don't want to obviously devolve into relativism or anything. I think that it's important for us to, I think that it's important for us to be aware where we might have blind spots because we all potentially could. So uh, we all do. And so for us to make sure that we are addressing oppression whenever we find it. We just have to make sure that we're not harboring bias to the best of our ability. Um, and so when you look at intellectuals who don't, I mean, as far as I know, Edward Said, for instance, had no interest in animals um, or anything beyond human oppression. But I find his work extremely useful to apply to animal ethics. Um, so I think that to dismiss intellectuals who have not come around on this particular issue would be a mistake because um, it would mean that we are not able to use a good deal of work. But I know that that's something that other people might not agree on. So, yeah. Um, I wonder to what extent a sort of liberal egalitarianism is key here in that, in that uh, for a lot of people who don't extend the sphere of rights, say, Mm -hmm. or welfare concern to include animals. Um, it's because they say, well, blacks and yellows and women, and d d d they are fundamentally the same as us, but animals aren't. <laughs> so it's like that there is a difference, in, you know, when you move outside the human sphere, we're a straightforward egalitarian. I, I mean, I think it breaks down even within the human sphere of diversity. Yeah. But, but it, it, it faces strains it can't, it, it can't overcome when you extend it beyond the species to um, laying hands and 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 so I, I don't think that I don't I wouldn't equate liberal egalitarianism with rationality, but it, they've almost been equated in the Western moral imagination for for some centuries now, and and I think a lot of like the average academic, you know, is is is, is kind of liberal egalitarian in their political sensibilities. So they see like in the back of their mind thinking, but there is a difference. There. That the reason I don't extend it to include animals is because they are really 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 different, and so. It, if we rely too much on that liberal egalitarianism to extend that sphere, and I think Singer might be guilty of this a little bit. I mean, well, no, the utilitarianism can help get around that in, in profound ways, but but so many other things we need to use besides that to get people to care about animals. You know, it's, a lot of it has to do with just opening the heart. I think once the heart is open to them, all arguments become extraneous yeah, or against. Yeah, that's kind of the interesting thing that is most difficult is that it seems that people com uh, come to these arguments after they've already taken action. So how do you get people to take action first? And then once once they have taken action and there's no longer the, the sense of guilt, um, that's when you're able to face ideology because you're not as complicit in it anymore. And so that's kind of another interesting paradox as well. Ian yeah. and then Judy. And so are medical doctors considered intellectuals? That's a question I can put to the floor. What do you all think? Generally, no. Generally, no? no. They don't have any it? philosophical training, generally. I dated him for five years. He was a top doctor. His father, his father had been a top researcher in Britain, and no. no. Yeah, speak up for the oppressed. I mean, some might on their personal endeavor, if they but in their training, no. I think they do be a Mechanism yes, well. many do, yeah. For health? Often for health, rather for health, than... For health and uh, for the planet. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I think probably my answer would be they can be, just as some lawyers can be, just as some yeah, farmers can be, you know, yeah. Yeah, every medical test, uh, textbook says that you, when you fall sick, you need to eat more fruits and vegetables. <laughs> what textbooks yeah. have you read? That's, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the head of food bank. You have to be serving the fruits and vegetables. So it's not a rocket science that you shouldn't be eating meat. <laughs> yeah, Judy. Uh, no, it's more so just of a comment in terms of uh, caring more for animals and, and how to reach out more. And, and while I think it is really important to have um, studies and evidence um, to, to stand up for it, I think. Part of it is also having personal connections with it because you're so disconnected from that textbook or, or even in the news where you see things that are happening in another country, but until there's someone that's connected to you personally and affected, that's when you take more insight to it. And so I think in your first discussion question when you're um, talking about your lifestyle and, and kind of showing that you don't need to do too many things to change your lifestyle to become a vegan, and because I'm a non-vegan, I'm also so appreciative for that whereas there's that inclusion, um, and you're not on the defense, or you're going to attack me because I'm a non-vegan. Because, I don't. But in that sense, when you are there and you're willing to speak about it, but also partake in, in parties and, and whatnot, I think that's also really helpful too. And, and the parallel that I can think of on my end is, um, I have beliefs in, in feminism as well, and when I go into an office surrounded by a majority of men, and all of a sudden if I'm kind of, oh, you're a feminist, they have this very vague yeah. idea of what it is, and like, well, what are you about? And, and also they're on defense, it's like, well, I like to come into the look, okay, well, I know that they respect me, I know that they are fond of me, so if I can show them how I act normally, and that there are many f different varieties and forms of feminism, that they can also learn and appreciate that as well. So I think having those combinations can help explore more in that sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, Sorry. that's really nice of you to say, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah um, I'm just responding to, I'm sorry, I don't know the gentleman's name, but the comment you made just yeah. last, and, you know, the, the, the argument is presented um, like an attack. You know, animals just aren't like us, you know, like blacks are like us, women are like us, you know, sort of disabled are like us, but animals are not like us. But that's, again, falling back into their strategy and succumbing to their strategy of that's based on the idea that animals don't have, let's say, language, reason. And by the way, animals do have reason and language. I mean, animals use symbolic communication. The higher animals, the higher mammals definitely use symbolic communication. But be that as it may, you know, that, you know, that's a side argument. But in philosophy, there is another, you know, and I was sort of stressing this earlier tonight, that there's another threat starting with figures like, let's say, David Hume, huge figure, you'll know that, um, that what is the most important, the most informative on human ethics is not reason. That's an old Catholic Church argument through Aquinas, through Aristotle. That it's not reason, it's emotion. That our ethics are rooted in emotion. That our suffering is rooted in emotion. That our reality is largely colored by emotion. Now, and so from David Hume through the whole, you know, sort of like the development of enlightenment thinking and, and scientific thinking, because David Hume, who by the way had some exposure to Buddhist ideas through the Jesuit monastery of La Flèche in France, where he stayed and talked to, you know, sort of Asian hands that had come back Jesuits. Surprising, right? You know, and there's no, when you look internally, there's no self to be seen. That's probably where he got it. In any case, um, He's an Enlightenment thinker, and there's this thread of that, no, ethics is not grounded on reason the way the Catholics insist dogmatically. It's grounded on emotion. And if you ground ethics on emotion and notice your own emotions, then you'll be more respectful of the feelings and sufferings of, you know, of the body. This is an anti-Cartesian argument as well. Yeah, sure. And so all the way through the existentialists, even unto, you know, the 21st century, there's that second line of development, but it, it has tended to be, uh, let's say, fought against largely by masculinist thinkers because what is it to be the classic alpha macho male? Suppress your emotions. Yeah. Don't show your vulnerability. Don't show your suffering. Don't admit to it on pain of death because if you do, you'll be a little girl. Ew. And so, or an animal screaming its pain. 
And so that's where you get them. And I have successfully, in life, gone under the surface of somebody who is thinking that way, including male intellectuals, and gotten them on their emotions and made them hurt, made them suffer, made them scream. And that is the only way that we're going to get at the enormous suppression of the fact of animal suffering, because that's where they're the same as us. They suffer. They feel. You know, all the way down to the lobsters and the shrimps and the fish. And so, on the other hand, though, to admit to that would bring down the patriarchy. Well, yeah, definitely. It would it's bring down the patriarchy. On how and so, it's not just about animals. It's not just about right? animals. It's about the suffering of the whole world, you know, what we're doing to this planet. It's an incredible, you know, delusional race to, let's say, to, you know, I, I'd say almost psychotic. I'd say that the average masculine, and I'm excluding every man that's in this room, the average masculine alpha male snool is psychotic. <laughs> that's a grand old feminist term from Andrea Dworkin. It's sort of like a real prick. In, 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 in every sense of the word, including the Lacanian. Um, and so, they're psychotic. They're nuts. And that's what we're fighting. We're fighting psychotics. We're fighting madmen. Yeah, they're denying their own suffering. They're denying the suffering of women, of blacks, of the earth, of animals. And the only way to get them is to make them suffer. Make them, you know, you know, psychoanalysis. When they start to, when these narcissists, these psychopaths start to, you know, they, they call them the patriarch sometimes. You know, radical feminists call them the patriarch, patriarchal psychopath. So they're in denial about suffering, their own and of others. They impose suffering and then they deny they do it. They minimize, you know, whatever. You know, the strategy of the abuse, the domestic abuser, minimize, deny, deflect, etc. They're doing it worldwide. And so, and when they do it to animals, they're denying. And so the only way is under their skin and to get them on their own suffering, admit that they suffer. This is what Buddhism, by the way, does. The first move in Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, is first you admit that you're suffering. And that's a huge move. The West is not ready for that. I mean, Nietzsche said this. Western man is too primitive, too savage, yet to admit that he suffered. You know, if you read uh, Nietzsche's The Antichrist, Western man is just too primitive to admit that he suffers. He's too, too much of a tribal savage to admit that. He said, Nietzsche said that in the East they're more advanced, they're culturally more advanced. Well, they call it a late, tired culture too. Yeah, exactly. Buddhism exactly. is a religion for a late and tired, yeah. gentle, noble culture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he really valorized it. And so, this is what we're dealing with. You know, we, we should all wake up and know that we're talking, you know, we're, we're dealing with perambulating, half asleep psychopaths. You yeah. want to get I think them. You want to wake yeah. them up. You make them feel. You make them suffer. Then they'll maybe, just maybe on a bed, you know, understand the suffering of others, whether it's their beaten wife or their neglected children or the animals being torn apart in the death factories. I'm Until not you sure do that, they're in as power. As Why they're in power is because they make this move. Awesome. Yeah, as long as ideology is in place, though, I think that um, it's very easy for. Um, people who are in power to, uh, when they feel victimized or when they feel pain, to immediately turn blame to whoever the ideology already victimizes, right? So until we start to be self-aware, I think that's um, not going to change in a, on a large scale, yeah. I just want to say, I think uh, they, these two things need to work together, like heart and reason, I think. So the empathy and feeling, acknowledging your own suffering and then seeing it in others can, you know, it inspires a strong emotion. But what you do with it next can sometimes be helpfully informed by reasoned argument that might come from a variety of philosophers, a variety of sources, also Eastern religion or, or whatever. But I think that we don't have to have a binary and it's probably a dialogue between oh, yeah. your heart and your mind as you experience something and you think about it, you experience and you think about it. So many of us go to vigils and you have a powerful emotional reaction and what do you do next? Um, so that, that emotional reaction might inform your activism, but then you might also think about what's the best strategies, or you might change your philosophy in response and then go back again and again have that emotional reaction. So I don't think we should think of it as a binary, but I, I think they're both very important pillars together. So. Yeah. Um, 
right, I think this idea of emotion versus reason in ethics is a bit of a fall that got to me. Um, and I, well, I, I think we kind of cross the line here when it's something uh, ethics should be based on. It. Okay, so you said ethics should be ethics should be based on. It. I mean, you, you said that someone said that ethics should be based on 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 emotion, but I think it was kind of a line cross here when talking about suffering, because I mean, this this suffering is, I mean, for many people, the the subject matter of ethics, and so when we compare that as when 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 we and when so if so if we say uh so that doesn't make it based on emotion and reason because I mean that once we have the subject matter we need the method yes yeah yes um and I mean I I'm I'm it's more very hands on it's very hands on you can't you 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 have to act it out you can't use reason. To demonstrate what I'm talking about, you have to go out in the world and, and enact it. It's an embodied um, praxis. It's a praxis. Victoria, you were going to say something. Oh, uh, yeah, I had a question. Uh, th thank you for your talk. Like, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it seemed to me that what you were saying was very similar to a paper that Noam Chomsky uh, wrote on uh, the responsibility of intellectuals, that intellectuals have a responsibility to to uh, speak up when they see injustice and to, when they uh, see oppression of others that isn't uh, recognized. And I mean, like, there is a Marxist thread running throughout your whole talk where this, this idea that uh, intellectual work, intellectual acts, that theorizing is useless if it doesn't lead to social change and I, I, of course, I believe all of that, but uh, I, yeah, uh, one thing that I wanted to address, and I think this relates to how animal studies, like even though it's such a growing field, it's becoming quite internally contested, is, uh, it is where, uh, with uh, some of the postmodernists, where there was this tendency to get wrapped up in all of these complicated, ontologies, uh, and with the ostensible purpose of 